uh, to switch computers. Uh, actually, we now you know trying to set up uh, yeah. another computer where it didn't work. Uh, so I have to go back uh, to my laptop. Okay. Okay. Uh, Oh, uh, uh, so, so let me start now. Inshallah. Okay. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in, amma ba'd. Uh, so uh, last week uh, we were talking about the Saraya and Ghazawat. Uh, uh, collectively, these are the military expeditions. Uh, either led by the Prophet وسلم, himself or uh, where he appointed leaders uh, and sent out most likely small groups of people. And we talked uh, uh, specifically about the, uh, the, the Sharia of Nakhla, which is known uh, as the Sharia of Nakhla, which was in the south of uh, Mecca. So it's a very long distance away from Medina. The Prophet وسلم, uh, with uh, very strict orders uh, sent uh, a small group of men, uh, and uh, we talked about what uh, occurred from that. Uh, the Muslims uh, killed uh, a couple of men. There was a small group of people who were uh, uh, with the caravan, uh, with the wealth of Quraysh. Uh, the Muslims attacked uh, at the end of Rajab, the last day of Rajab, uh, which was one of the sacred months. And so there was a big... Uh, scenario about that afterwards uh, from Quraysh uh, and their allies, uh, especially, um, and also from the Jews, that they uh, are, you know, violating the sacred month. We talked about that and the propaganda that uh, comes out of a situation like that. You know, there is a war of words, uh, and there is also, you know, the physical war. Uh, so a lot of that was a, a war of words. And Muslims have to understand that and be able uh, to understand, you know, how to deal with a situation like that. Uh, and we talked about the relevance of it uh, in uh, our times and what is happening today in, uh, in uh, Palestine and so on. Uh, so, uh, and then we also talked about uh, uh, one that was led by the Prophet himself. Uh, which uh, ended up uh, in uh, into the Battle of Badr. Uh, the, the, there was a caravan of Quraysh uh, that was going uh, to, uh, to the north, passing close to Medina. The Muslims uh, tried to intercept it, uh, but they missed it. It went ahead, and uh, the uh, Quraysh uh, did their trading in, uh, in the north. And they were coming back. Uh, the Prophet was, was keen to follow his movements. And so when he was coming back, he knew uh, that uh, it was on its way, it was going to pass close to Medina. Uh, and the leader of that uh, caravan was uh, Abu Sufyan. He was, of course, a, a non Muslim a mushrik at that time and leader of Mecca. And so he was coming with a caravan, which was uh, not uh, very strongly protected, you know, with, uh, with armed men and so on. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, uh, to his men, that is the people in Medina, uh, here is the caravan of Quraysh coming, passing nearby. Uh, and this is your chance uh, to get something out of it, uh, the wealth uh, from it and so on. Uh, so a number of uh, men uh, went out with the Prophet ﷺ. They, uh, both um, uh, from the Muhajirin as well as the Ansar. And this was one of the few instances. In fact, before this, uh, there was no instance when the uh, Ansar had participated in any of the Saraya. Uh, this was uh, the first instance uh, when uh, uh, they joined with the Prophet وسلم, and this was also a very large group group of men. Comparatively speaking, all of the others before were very small uh, detachments uh, of uh, men. Uh, this one was quite large, uh, 300 and something uh, men. And there are slight differences in the amount uh, in the books of uh, Sira, 313, 314 or so. And, uh, when uh, 
uh, Abu Sofyan was passing close by Medina with his caravan, he knew uh, that uh, it was subject to attack by the Muslims. And so he was very uh, uh, careful of that, trying to make sure that uh, he, uh, you know, they, they are unable to do him harm or do the caravan harm. And he was on the lookout for any news. Uh, so, the, you know, he, uh, he he tried to gather as much information as he could. And when he got information that Muslims were nearby, Muslims had come out of Medina, there were a group of them, perhaps uh, searching for this caravan. Uh, he decided to take a different route. And in, by doing so, he was able to escape uh, from the hands of the Muslims. Uh, but before uh, he was able to do that, he had sent a message or somebody, uh, you know, had gone to Mecca with a message uh, that a caravan uh, was in danger. Come out uh, and defend your caravan. So the people in Mecca uh, came out, Abu Jahl and others, uh, they assembled a, a, an army, sort of a thousand men, approximately, uh, and they started to march uh, towards uh, uh, where uh, the caravan was uh, supposed to be. Eventually, they ended up at Badr, the place that is called Badr. Uh, the Muslims, uh, under the leadership of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, had uh, come out uh, of uh, Medina, heading for the caravan, and they did not expect war. They were lightly armed. You know, um, they were not really uh, prepared for a battle as such. But then eventually they heard that uh, the Meccans had come out from Mecca uh, and they were ready uh, for war and they were ready for uh, to defend the caravan. Uh, so eventually the two armies, uh, or the two groups of people, one was an army of a thousand people, and the other was uh, the Muslims, uh, 300 or so of them, uh, not uh, fully prepared for a battle. So the Prophet when, when they camped, uh, and you know, before the battle, the Prophet consulted with them. Uh, he was not consulting just with the leaders uh, from among them, with the you know, opinion makers and so on, uh, with the important people, not just a few uh, for them, but he consulted with everyone. He, he, he discussed with all of them because now they are confronted with a situation which uh, they did not expect. <clears throat> there is going to be a battle and are they ready for it? Uh, and so Abu Bakr radiallahu and who spoke, uh, Omar radiallahu and who spoke, uh, Mikdad uh, ibn uh, uh, he also spoke, you know, a number of people, all from Quraysh, just spoke, and they were all in favor of going ahead. We are not going to hold back. We are ready to meet them, no matter uh, uh, what uh, lesser equipment we have, and so on. We are ready to do battle with them. Uh, and the, uh, the Prophet said, I'm still wanted to hear from the Ansar because, uh, you know, they had not uh, uh, made a contract with the Prophet said, to defend him outside of Medina. So he kept asking uh, for the opinion of the people until the Ansar realized that he was asking them for their opinion uh, and to see whether they were prepared for the battle. And the leaders among them spoke, uh, Saad ibn Mu'ad and uh, others, uh, and uh, they said, go wherever you go, uh, uh, we will follow you. You go into the sea, we will follow you there. And we are prepared you know, to go with you anywhere that it takes. Uh, and we will not say like uh, Banu Israel said to Musa Ali, he said, I'm you and your Lord go and fight and we we'll sit here and, uh, and wait. But we will go with you wherever. Uh, and the, you know, the, they spoke so well, so eloquently and so well. Uh, this really raised uh, the, uh, the morale of uh, the Muslims, you know, and all of them were now prepared for this battle. Uh, in addition to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent rain to them overnight uh, and helped them to get a good sleep uh, and perhaps, you know, made the ground firm for them and so on and so forth. A number of things uh, because of this rain uh, and whatever else, Allah, in whatever other way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused, caused them to be tranquil and to be ready and prepared for the battle next day. They had a good sleep, etc.
Uh, so they they got up in the morning, they were not afraid, uh, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there was uh, the army of Quraysh, uh, a thousand or so men. Uh, how uh, how was that uh, known? Uh, the Muslims were able to uh, bring into in, into the presence of the Prophet uh, a, a young boy who perhaps had knowledge of uh, the uh, army of uh, Quraysh. Uh, and so he was interrogated and uh, he did not know the numbers, uh, how, how strong they were. The Prophet Sallam asked him, uh, well, how many uh, camels uh, do they slaughter for food? Uh, so every one, one day it is nine, the other day, 10 camels. This uh, showed the Prophet Sallam that the number of, uh, of, the, uh, of Quraysh were nine, between 900 and 1,000. Uh, so they the, the outnumbered the Muslims uh, three to one approximately, uh, and they were much uh, more equipped. And uh, over the night before the battle, uh, they got the news uh, that, uh, Quray, that, that the caravan of Abu Sufyan was safe. Uh, and so uh, some of them started to say, we don't need to continue, we don't need to fight, let's go back to, to Mecca, everything is okay. Uh, others were saying, no, uh, we will not do that. And especially Abu Jahal, he was saying, we will not do that. We will camp overnight. Uh, we will, you know, have uh, these singers who came with them, female singers, dancers, and so on. Uh, them, you know, put on an entertainment for us, and so we'll enjoy ourselves during the night. Uh, and everybody will hear of us. All of the Arabs will hear of us, and so on. And they, uh, this will make them more afraid of us. You know, before that, Quraysh used to enjoy uh, the privileges uh, from the rest of the Arabs. They could travel anywhere. They would not be attacked. They would not be molested and so on. Uh, but Abu Jahal and others like him, they wanted uh, the, uh, the Arabs uh, to have greater fear of them. And so they said, we'll, we'll do it overnight. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, Quraysh uh, were split in their ranks, so, you know, they were undecided. Some of them uh, did not want to, to go into battle. Others uh, wanted to, to go, really, did, uh, but were not uh, actually prepared for it. You know, the singing and dancing and so on uh, during the night uh, made them ill prepared to go into a, a battle. And even before that, uh, when they were leaving Mecca, uh, to come on this journey. They knew that they were going into a battle. And there were some of them who stayed behind and did not want to go. Abu Lahab was one of them. Uh, he sent somebody else who was uh, who had borrowed money from him and was indebted to him. You go and I'll free you, uh, free you of your debt. Uh, so the, the Kuffar, the army of, uh, of the Kuffar were divided. And so they went into this battle and they were defeated by the Prophet uh, by the by the Muslims. Uh, before the battle, the Prophet had, you know, there, there are many details. I, I don't want to go into all of the details, but uh, there are various ways in which the Prophet prepared the Muslims uh, for victory. You know, prepare their um, you know their, their their willpower and so on to go into this battle. You know, he pointed out the spots where the leaders of Quraysh uh, will be killed, Abu Jahl and others. Uh, and this is exactly where they were killed in the battle. So uh, that is one of the ways, uh, and I mentioned uh, other ways in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared them by sending uh, rain, etc. And then in the battle itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent angels uh, and uh, it is reported that the angels uh, uh, may have uh, killed uh, some of the uh, enemy, some of uh, some of the kuffar. Uh, this is a matter I think that is disputed whether uh, they actually uh, whether the, the the angels actually killed them or not. But the angels were there. Uh, the Muslims were aware of that, and you know this is something that uh, you know boosted their. Uh, morale tremendously that to have the angels there. Of course, one angel is sufficient to deal with all of the enemy. 
uh, but there were a, a, quite a number of them who were there in the battle. Perhaps uh, they were uh, just encouraging the Muslims on, perhaps uh, fighting in the battle itself. Uh, but the outcome of the battle was that the Muslims uh, were victorious. A number of uh, the enemy were killed, about 70 or so. Another 70 were captured. And uh, around 14 or so of the Muslims were killed. The Prophet ﷺ remained with his, with his men uh, in the area after Quraysh had left, the rest of Quraysh had left. They had retreated, you know. Uh, and um, the, the, re the reason for that was perhaps uh, to make sure that none of them would be coming back uh, to try to attack the Muslims uh, by surprise and so on. To make sure that everything is cleaned up in the bat battlefield, that the, people, the dead are buried, etc. Uh, there is no indication that Salah was done, Salat al Janaza was done for the Muslims. Uh, and this is perhaps the Shohada, you know, the, 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 those who, who die in battle, they are Shohada. Uh, and Salat al Janaza is not uh, done for them. Uh, so this is a fiqhi matter. Um, now, uh, before I continue, uh, I want to raise some questions uh, with you, hopefully, inshallah, you'll be able to uh, give me the answers. And I want you to participate, you know, as much as possible uh, in uh, the discussions. Uh, I don't want to you know, be talking uh, all by myself, right? I want you to participate. If you want to speak, uh, then do that. If you uh, want to... Uh, you know, type and send a message in the chat. You can you can do that. Uh, so the question is um, uh, going back to uh, an earlier discussion that we had, uh, uh, and this is a matter that we need to have very clearly in our uh, in our heads. That is uh, the purpose of fighting. Uh, we had said that uh, it took place in various stages. The permission, first of all, there was no permission at all to fight. Then later on, permission was given to fight, but there was only permission and not uh, mandatory. And later on, it was made mandatory based on the circumstances. Uh, Muslims and all Muslims had to participate. Uh, that is all, all of the men. Uh, there are also women who came into various battles, uh, Muslim women, uh, but uh, they were helpers in the background, uh, maybe tending the, wound, the wounded, uh, cooking food for them, feeding them, and so on, right? Doing doing uh, that kind of chore uh, that is needed in a battle. Uh, and we'll say that in the Battle of Ahad and other, there are some of them who actually came forward and, you know, picked up uh, arms and started to fight. Uh, the Saiba is one of those in the Battle of Ahad. Uh, so uh, what is the uh, purpose of uh, fighting uh, in Islam? Uh, any answers to that? You can speak or you can type. <clears throat> and why is it that uh, the Muslims uh, were prepared to uh, fight, prepared to go into battle by the Saraya and the Ghazawat? that took place uh, uh, before as well as after the Battle of Badr. Battle, the Battle of Badr is one of the Ghazawat, right? Uh, one of the major battles uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, uh, then, uh, we can say that the Muslims uh, were prepared by these uh, uh, military expeditions that took place before the Battle of Badr, as well as after that. Uh, uh, to uh, and we talked about some of the benefits that came from them, not only uh, uh, knowing the terrain, being able to move around, uh, understand uh, the various tribes that are around Medina, where they are uh, hostile or, or their allies or so, right? Uh, to give dawa to people, you know, uh, invite them to Islam. Uh, there, there are many um, uh, benefits that came out of the Saraya. Uh, but uh, the purpose of fighting itself.
Okay, I see uh, one answer here to say, keep the Muslims and also to, uh, to be able to continue to practice Islam and establish uh, a nation, so to speak. Okay, uh, that's uh, one answer. The answer is very good. Um, any other answers? Any other answers? Um, uh, you know, I can't hear if anyone is speaking. I don't know if anyone is speaking. <clears throat> now, th this is an important matter. And, you know, be based on <clears throat> all the things that are going, around, or going on around us uh, in these days, uh, we have to understand the importance of it. Uh, the, uh, the the Muslims uh, need to be able uh, to fight. Uh, they need to be able to go into battle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Anfal, which was revealed after the Battle of Badr, says, وَأَعِدُّ لَهُمْ مَا سَتَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ وَمِنْ رِبَاطِ الْخَيْلِ تُرْهِبُونَ بِهِ عَدُوَ اللَّهِ وَعَدُوَكُمْ Prepare whatever might you can for the enemy. Uh, you know, Ribat al Khail, you know, all the training with the horses and so on, uh, you know, horse riding, etc. Prepare all of that and the weapons, uh, you know, you try to get the best weapons and so on. Uh, uh, practice using them uh, so that you are prepared for battle. The, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave that command because uh, it is expected that the kuffar will not lead, leave the Muslims alone. Uh, as happened uh, in the in this case uh, in the in the Sira, uh, the kuffar of Quraysh did not leave uh, the Muslims alone. Okay, you have uh, escaped out of Mecca, go your own way and uh, and be at peace and so on. That was not their position. Uh, they can continue to send uh, threatening messages to Muslims uh, in Medina. We're going to destroy you and so on and so forth. Right. They're the ones who had opened hostility against the Muslims, and th that hostility was continuing. Uh, and they did not allow Muslims to come into Mecca to do Hajj and Umrah and so on. So they debarred them uh, from practices that should have been open to everyone in the Arab Arabian Peninsula. Uh, nobody should be debarred from coming into Mecca. Nobody should be in Mecca and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, they had broken all of the laws uh, with uh, the, where the Muslims are concerned. Uh, and the hostility was open. Uh, so, uh, 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 and this is something that is expected to continue. The, the non-Muslim, the Mushrikeen, the idolaters, the Kuffar in general, they will continue throughout uh, all times you know, to show hostility to Muslims. Uh, and Muslims must be prepared to deal with them. Unfortunately, we have a different, uh, a different situation today. Uh, Muslims are, are not prepared. In fact, uh, there, there is no homeland for the Muslims now, right? There's no homeland. You know, all of the Muslim, or the majority of Muslim rulers uh, you know, have uh, sold out the cause of the, uh, of the Muslims. Uh, and although they have armies, uh, these armies are not prepared to do battle with the disbelievers. Uh, the aim of it is not to, to spread the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the aim uh, we can see uh, in the seerah and in the Quran itself. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about uh, fighting uh, and about jihad and so on, jihad fi sabilillah, it is always jihad fi sabilillah. There's hardly any place where the word jihad is used without fi sabilillah also being used along with it. And this is for that matter to be very, very clear in our minds that our jihad uh, and any fighting uh, should be fi sabilillah for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for any other cause. Uh, it is not uh, for the country. There is no uh, nationalism uh, in Islam like that, right? The nationalism of Islam is 
is Islam itself, right? We are fighting for the cause of Islam, uh, for the uh, propagation of Islam, for the prevention of attacks on Muslims, uh, for the safety of Muslims uh, and Islamic societies and so on. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, wherever there is corruption in the land, wherever people are being oppressed and so on, uh, and Muslims are called to do their duty, uh, the fighting can occur. So if we go uh, go into a place in order to liberate that place has happened in you know Islamic history, uh, many times they were called on to liberate a place or a people because they are being oppressed by the rulers. Uh, many of those who were under Byzantine ruler, ruler, rulers, although they were Christians, just like the Byzantines, just like the rulers themselves, uh, they were, were oppressed heavily, taxed heavily, and so on by, uh, by the rulers. Uh, There's a lot of oppression that was going on. And so the Muslim, uh, and the same with the Persian Empire, uh, the Muslims went to the, into those places to liberate the people. Wherever... Uh, uh, the dawah is not allowed to uh, to spread or to penetrate. Uh, jihad also has to be done in order to open the way uh, for the dawah to reach the people. Um, in many cases, the rulers are the ones who are blocking uh, the dawah from reaching the ears of the people. And so uh, things have to be changed in order for the dawah to reach. Uh, uh, Today, maybe every, almost everybody in the world has heard of Islam. The Dawah has reached people uh, to a greater or lesser extent, but still there's a lot of clarifications that need to be done, especially because the media is not in the hands of the Muslims and a lot of anti-Islamic propaganda is there. A lot of Islamophobia is being spread all around and so on. Uh, and these situations that are occurring in the world today, whether it's in Palestine or other places, uh, they are being used by the media to attack Islam, uh, to drown out the voices of Muslims. Uh, uh, you know, alhamd alhamdulillah, however, there's a lot of voices that are raised uh, uh, for the Islamic cause, for the Palestinian cause, for the Muslim cause, and so on. Uh, a lot of voices are, are, are out there trying to uh, rectify, you know, the, the news that people are re receiving, trying to correct uh, those, uh, uh, correct the news give uh, the, uh, you know, a proper perspective of them and so on, but it's a very, very difficult task. You know, Alhamdulillah, also that there are many non-Muslims uh, who are on the side of the oppressed. Uh, they are on the side of the Palestinians uh, and uh, they are defending their rights and so on. Uh, and they are calling for, you know, cessation of the bombardment of, uh, of the Palestinians, etc. Uh, so and they're, they're, they're calling, you know, for the cessation of hostilities against them, uh, as well as calling for, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, the proper, uh, proper assessments uh, to be done to find out who is really the guilty party uh, in, uh, in, in this scenario. So... And, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and with the efforts uh, of uh, uh, a lot of uh, Palestinians and Muslim brothers and sisters and so on, the world, you know, has reached out to uh, and continues to re reach out to a large amount of people. Uh, so hopefully, inshallah, this will change the narrative. Uh, we have to give our narrative, the Islamic narrative, the Palestinian narrative and so concerning the situation you know it's uh, you know, it's very horrifying to hear that there are those who uh, and they're not necessarily uh, you know israelis or, or zionists or so but uh, there are many who are siding with them and say many politicians in this country and say you know saying that um, uh, the israelis have a right to, to defend themselves uh, in, in other words, they have a right to attack the Palestinians and destroy the entire society and so on. Right? Uh, it's very appalling to see that you know, the, 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 uh, while, while they have double standards, they're not acknowledging those double standards. Uh, they're accusing others, uh, they're accusing Muslims of killing children and uh, you know, committing atrocities and so on. Uh, and they're allowing the Israelis uh, to bombard uh, the entire of Gaza 
uh, killing uh, women, uh, uh, children, uh, so many hundreds and thousands of children have been killed already in this battle, etc. So uh, if, uh, you know, we uh, unfortunately, since we, you know, since the Muslims uh, do not have power, even the Muslim lands, we do not have the power and the army, Muslim armies are kept, kept back from involving in the fight. Uh, we, we see the need to, uh, you know, prepare uh, Muslims who are ready uh, when when there is an Islamic state. You know, uh, uh, there should be people who are willing to fight uh, you know, for the defense of it and for the defense of the rights of uh, Muslims, etc. Uh, it's a uh, it's a very important uh, thing to understand. So we move ahead. Uh, the Muslims were victorious in the battle uh, of Badr, and uh, they, when, when they brought back uh, the captives, uh, 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 about 70 of them, uh, to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ opened a discussion as to what to do with them. Uh, set them free without any compensation, set them free with compensation, or kill them all. And there were various opinions uh, concerning this matter. Uh, the Prophet uh, took the uh, position, which was the one that was given by Abu Bakr, uh, that we should uh, take uh, compensation for them. Uh, let their relatives come uh, and pay uh, for their release. Uh, so we at least we'll be able to gain something, you know, out of uh, having them as captives. Uh, this also indicates to us that uh, this is something that can be done. Uh, the Prophet was in favor of this, and he he did that. Uh, uh, you know, there is the verse uh, uh, or verses that were revealed, uh, saying that uh, uh, the the far in this first battle against uh, the kuffar against the disbelievers the better thing would have been to uh, to slaughter them all, to kill them all. Uh, this is what they deserve. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not allow that to happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed the, the, uh, some of these men to be taken as captives, allowed them to be ransomed and so on. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed uh, that the better thing would have been to, to, to kill them all because they, all, they had all you know, declared war against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger uh, and the Muslims. Uh, uh, one of the uh, ways in which they could ransom themselves if they could not, you know, give uh, money or, or, or the jewelry or kind, and kind uh, anything in kind, uh, they could teach uh, Muslim, Muslims or Muslim children, uh, 10 of them uh, to read and write. And then if they do that, they will be set free. Uh, this is something unique uh, in, in the history of all battles. You know, the Prophet ﷺ valued education, valued reading and writing, knowledge and so on, to this extent uh, that uh, the non-Muslims were able to, to ransom themselves or their relatives were able to ransom them you know, if uh, they could teach Muslims to read and write. And this is one of the ways in which uh, the Prophet wasallam made the Muslims a literate nation. Very, very quickly he was able to do that, uh, to make them a literate nation. So even the children were learning to read and write. Uh, this is the uh, extent to which, you know, education, uh, knowledge and reading and writing and so on was valued. And this is coming out of a society that was generally illiterate. Uh, but we also see uh, in this uh, matter uh, that perhaps more people in Quraysh, uh, in Mecca, were literate than people in Medina. And why is this so? Because of the differences of those uh, two societies. Uh, uh, Quraysh, uh, the, the Meccans, uh, were traders. And so when they traded, when they went abroad, travels and so on, and they traded, uh, perhaps they had to loan things or they had to lend things um, uh, without getting immediate compensation for it. You know, they sold things, and, uh, you know, and they, uh, 
uh, they could not get the payment for it immediately and so on. So they had to write down things uh, uh, and, and so um, the, uh, a number of them had developed, you know, the ability to read and write uh, because of that situation. Whereas in Medina, the Muslim or uh, the people there, uh, the Ansar, uh, were mainly farmers. And so as farmers, they did not uh, need to read and write so much, right? They, they did move, uh, a lot of manual labor in the farms. Uh, not uh, needing to read and write. Uh, so less of them uh, were able to read and write. Uh, this is one thing that we noticed uh, from, uh, that came out of this battle here, uh, that there were people uh, who were captured uh, by the Muslims uh, from Mecca. Uh, they were able to read and write. Uh, and uh, so they were able to free themselves uh, by teaching, reading and writing. Uh, and the when that when that battle finished, you know this was uh, not the end of it, of it. Quraysh was very sore for the losses. Uh, Abu Jahl and others were killed, right, in in that battle. So they were very sore for that, and they started to prepare for another battle against the Muslims. This time they are going to attack Medina. Uh, so they started preparations for that almost immediately after the Battle of Badr. And there are other things that happened also. You know, uh, the, the Jews in Medina, uh, they started to say, well, you have encountered people who are not skilled in battle, and that's why you were able to win. They were telling the Muslims this. Uh, but if you, you know, have to fight against us, then you'll see who the men are. Uh, so... Uh, there was this kind of propaganda thing. <clears throat> so although although the Muslims were victorious in the battle, you know, that did not uh, stop enmity. In fact, uh, the enmity increased all around them. So from Quraysh, from the Mushrikeen, they started to prepare for another battle. And then there were these words and so that, that were coming uh, from the Jews. And then the hypocrites uh, who are secretly, you know, non-Muslims, uh, but they claim to be Muslims, uh, they were also siding with the Jews and uh, and so on. So uh, the uh, the difficulties that uh, uh, the Muslims are that the Islamic society, the growing the, you know the young Islamic society uh, that is developing in Medina would have to face and so on was not ended was not was not finished with one battle. Uh, things were were going to get more and more complicated, uh, more and more challenging. Uh, lots, a lot, a lot more uh, difficulties uh, are going to come, and challenges are going to confront them. So uh, the Muslims always had to be prepared. As the Prophet and of course continued uh, that kind of military training and so on. You know, organized uh, them, uh, and there, uh, while uh, perhaps uh, throughout the entire uh, the Sira period, that is during the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, all Muslims, all Muslim men. Could be expect, ex, or should be expected to participate in the battle, uh, and perhaps you know this is because of the background that they came from with the various tribes, and they already had some idea, you know, some ex, perhaps in fighting and so on. So uh, to be fully prepared uh, for battles and so on did not take too much uh, out of them. You know, they could go ahead and prepare themselves for, for that, and so every every Muslim was expected to respond to the call. Uh, but later on, you know, as the Islamic state uh, or states uh, developed, Islamic empire and so on developed, uh, everybody was not called on to fight. Uh, all, uh, all the citizens of an Islamic state were not called on to fight. To fight. Uh, the, there had to be, you know, a standing army, people who are trained for that purpose, to, for the uh, defense uh, of uh, the Islamic society, the Islamic state. Uh, and so... You know, what developed uh, in the Islamic State uh, was uh, what other states, other non-Muslim states had around them. But remember that the uh, amount of Muslims were still small in Medina uh, in the time of the Prophet wasallam, compared uh, to huge uh, empires that surround them, the Persians and the Byzantines and so on. Um, 
so uh, the question that I asked, um, uh, and so what is the next thing? You, you have read, you have read the books, hopefully, inshallah, uh, especially uh, the uh, this uh, small book of uh, uh, Sabai. Uh, on the Sarah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, maybe you have read uh, other sources also. So uh, what uh, what continue to have happen in Medina? I, I'm asking you to think of what uh, what uh, other things happened after the Battle of Badr uh, and after the ransom of the uh, of the captives, etc. Uh, what is the situation that continued in Medina and how did things develop after that? Uh, any, any answers to that question? Uh, what would you think, uh, what, what uh, do you think would be happening uh, in Medina? Okay, apart from the military preparations that still have to go on, and this is something that we talked about, uh, what else was continuing in Medina or developing. Do you mean like the Dawa itself? Okay, that's very good. Yes, that's one of them, the Dawa. Uh, 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 any, anything else? You know, uh, if you want to elaborate, you can. If not, uh, that that is uh, that is sufficient. And you can mention any other thing that you see. How uh, the Prophet Salam, of course, this is the Battle of Badr was in the second year of the Hijra in Ramadan, in the month of Ramadan, by the way, right? And that is the month in in which uh, fasting became. Uh, compulsory in Ramadan, the first Ramadan in which fasting became compulsory. Uh, so this was still in the early stages uh, in Medina, and the Prophet Saddam was uh, still, you know, developing the society or developing the Islamic State. So what uh, what other things had to develop or were developing in the society? Now, since, since you, uh, one of you mentioned Dawa, uh, let me expand on that a little bit, right? Uh, and we should understand all of these uh, situations. Uh, when uh, when the Muslims went out of Medina, of course, most of the people in Medina were Muslims, except for the, uh, the Jewish uh, tribe, the, the three tribes of Jews. Uh, and the Prophet was ensuring that the Dawa reached them uh, but he sent men also outside of Medina, as we know, in the Saraya, uh, and they were encountering people outside of Medina, and uh, they were giving the da'wah. Uh, so they were getting to know people, whether they were uh, 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 they were favorable towards Muslims or whether they were hostile towards Muslims and so on, uh, whether they accepted Islam or not, until eventually... You know, the the Dawa spread so much that sometimes it is, uh, you know, there were people who were accepting Islam uh, and uh, perhaps people in Medina, the Muslims in Medina were not even aware of it. The Prophet Sallallahu himself might not uh, be aware of all who had accepted Islam outside of Medina you know, because people uh, one by one or in small groups were, uh, were coming uh, into Islam, you know, and they had to be learning the basics of Islam uh, sometimes a tribe would accept Islam, and the Prophet ﷺ gave uh, instructions uh, to his men, the men that he was sending out. Uh, you know, you uh, wait before you attack anyone, any group of people. You have to see whether they are hostile or whether they are friendly towards Muslims, uh, whether they have accepted Islam or not accepted Islam. Perhaps if you hear, you go at the time anomaly attacks. Uh, uh, you know, uh, sudden attacks uh, against the enemy uh, was uh, at the time of Fajr, you know, very early in the morning. Uh, so when they go uh, 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 near to a people ready to attack them, they should wait and see uh, if they are performing Salatul Fajr. 
if they are calling the adhan and so on. And if and that's an indication, of course, that they are Muslims, so you can't attack them. Uh, so uh, that uh, uh, you know that uh, report actually is a uh, an indication that Islam was spreading, uh, and perhaps even without the knowledge of Muslims, people were accepting Islam, learning about Islam, establishing their salah, and so on. Uh, so that is one thing. Uh, I, I see a few other responses. Muslims were getting stronger, having a bigger presence. Uh, hypocrites uh, became active uh, against Muslims. Uh, Jews began uh, to undermine the Muslims, uh, the change of the Qibla. Uh, yes, a lot, a, a lot of things were happening. Uh, so those, uh, a, lot, a lot of the things that are mentioned here are the outside threats. The, the threats from, when I say outside, not outside of Medina, but outside of the Muslim community, coming from outside of the Muslim community against Muslims. Uh, so there were the Jews, there were the hypocrites, uh, and then there were uh, the Mushrikeen uh, all around Medina, as well as uh, uh, in, in Mecca, who are now preparing to attack uh, the Muslims again. Um, but the Prophet did not uh, stop his education of Muslims. This is something that continued. Uh, and I want to stress that, you know, we talked just a while ago about uh, the emphasis on, on knowledge and education uh, from the fact that uh, some of the, the uh, captives were able to ransom themselves uh, by teaching Muslims to read and write. Uh, so the education uh, among Muslims continued. And rem remember, there were uh, new Muslims all the time, people who are entering into Islam, new Muslims, and they had to be educated. Uh, they had to know all of the things that were already established in Islam, and uh, they were trying to live a normal life in Medina as much as possible with all of the enmity all around. Uh, and, uh, you know, how do you live a life uh, uh, in society normally? You know, you, you have your home, and you go out from your home, you do business, uh, you go to the marketplace, you interact with other people, you know, there are uh, the business relations that you establish and so on, uh, buying and selling, trading, etc. Uh, and then there are, you know, family ties that are established, marriages, etc. Uh, there are, uh, you know, friendship, uh, friendships that are established and so on. You know, uh, society is uh, very varied. There are many things that are happening all at the same time uh, in any society. Uh, and the Muslims uh, had to know the rules and regulations concerning each one of these situations, uh, especially whenever there were th things that were there in the days of Jahiliyyah that were not Islamic, whether they were family relations, uh, uh, you know, interaction between family members, interaction between friends, interaction between, you know, uh, business uh, partners, etc. Uh, things had, a lot of things had to be rectified. Uh, these things were not rectified overnight. Uh, they were when things happened, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reveal uh, verses or the Prophet would teach them what was the correct situation. Uh, and so uh, the, the, uh, the Islamic life was becoming more and more complete. The laws were being revealed concerning all aspects of life. Uh, you know, how do you dress in a proper way Islamically, you know, in the, in the open that is in public? Uh, uh, what is permissible out in the public and what is permissible, you know, when you're at home, uh, when you're with your family members uh, and perhaps uh, between spouses alone and so on. Uh, so, uh, you know, how, uh, how, what kind of, uh, of uh, buying and selling and trading and so on is permissible, what is not permissible? Uh, what is halal and haram in terms of eating, uh, in terms of, you know, a general, a general life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, uh, was revealing all of that and completing the Islamic way of life. Uh, now you will have recognized that, uh, you know, from a, an earlier discussion, uh, in fact, from the first, I think the, one of the first discussions, a lot of things were revealed in Mecca. Uh, many things uh, that the Muslims uh, could uh, practice uh, as individuals. 
and develop themselves morally and spiritually and so on. However, uh, uh, the you know the, uh, as a collectivity, there were very few laws that were revealed because uh, the Muslims could not uh, you know practice Islam openly in Mecca, could not li live a collective life openly, and so on. Uh, there was for them to uh, uh, no way in which they could uh, you know openly proclaim their uh, their Islam uh, and so on and so forth. We know the situation uh, as it was in Mecca. So there are many things Muslims could not. Uh, really practice uh, 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 as uh, in a normal uh, Islamic society. So now these things were uh, developing and things that uh, were uh, uh, were done maybe by mistake, you know, wrong, you know, with, with a with, with a you know a, a wrong understanding or so. Uh, these things were being corrected and the Islamic society was developing. Uh, so the education, uh, the morality, the spirituality of the community was still developing. You know, I want you to understand this point because this is this is of course extremely important. Uh, and whenever there there are battles that take place, these things uh, should not be neglected. In fact, uh, Islamic morals have to be displayed in the battlefield. Also, Islamic teachings have to be established uh, in the battlefield. How you deal with the enemy, how you treat the enemy, how you fight uh, against the enemy, and so on and so forth. Uh, to some things are, uh, and then uh, there's you when uh, when Muslims encounter certain situations and they started asking about them. A lot of things happened before and during and after the Battle of Badr uh, that raised uh, questions. Uh, and scholars have discussed. Our scholars, our fuqaha, have discussed and they have derived you know fiqhi rulings uh, from them. Uh, one of those uh, is. Um, uh, the uh, you, well, uh, normally we are not supposed to lie. Uh, we are supposed to be truthful. This is what the Islam calls for: for you to be truthful, to, for you to be upright, for you to deal sincerely with people, for you to not uh, cheat and deceive, and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, but uh, is uh, well, what is what is permissible in the battlefield? Uh, you know, from an incident that took place uh, before the Battle of Badr, uh, scholars have derived uh, that, in fact, there's a statement uh, uh, of the Prophet that uh, this is war. And so, uh, uh, you know, to paraphrase what he said, uh, uh, dece deception is permissible. In war, deception is permissible, and that is to deceive the enemy. The deception is uh, to throw the enemy off your track. Uh, you can deceive them in battle. Uh, you try to get the, the better of them, uh, and so deception uh, is permissible uh, in that situation. Is it permissible otherwise? Generally, it is not. I won't go into the you know fifty matter. There are some other cases besides a battle where uh, to tell a lie uh, would be permissible. Uh, but uh, the, those uh, fiqhi matters uh, we'll, we'll not deal with now. Uh, so things like that were also coming out of the battle, uh, uh, things that are relevant, not for battles alone, but uh, the way that Muslims uh, should uh, always conduct themselves, uh, how they should deal with people. Uh, so, uh, and then the, uh, later, later on uh, in, uh, you know, in other battles, uh, the Prophet وسلم, gave instructions that women and children should not be killed, uh, as well as uh, maybe the elders or old people who cannot participate in battle, who cannot fight against you. The old people should not be killed, as well as uh, those who have uh, religiously dedicated themselves, uh, you know, uh, 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 in monasteries and nunneries and so on. Uh, and, of course, you still have a lot of those uh, prevalent in the world today, a lot of people who are living in monasteries and so on. Unfortunately, some of those same people, uh, uh, they attack Muslims, uh, the, the Buddhists uh, who are, you know, many of them are monks uh, in their monasteries. But we, say, we, say, we saw what happened you know, in Burma. Uh, you know, how they dealt with the Muslims. So this, this was coming from the Buddhists. 
themselves, right? But generally speaking, the people who are dedicated, who have, um, you know, secluded themselves in the monasteries and uh, and so on, uh, they are people who are who do not fight. Uh, they are peaceful, uh, and so they should not be killed. They are dedicated to the worship of Allah, even though their worship might not be the correct way of worshiping Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and they may not have the correct uh, concept of who. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and who they are supposed to worship. Uh, so these kind of teachings, uh, the high Islamic standard of morality uh, was coming out uh, from these battles, from these situations, uh, the teachings were being explained, uh, and also in times of peace, uh, more and more of that, uh, when Muslims uh, interacted with, with each other in the marketplace or fa in family life, uh, marriages and, and sometimes divorces occurred and so on. You know, a lot of things were happening. Uh, and so the Muslims uh, needed guidance uh, in all aspects of life. Uh, and these things were being revealed. Uh, and the Prophet was explaining uh, things uh, to them. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the Muslims are expected uh, to have uh, some basic knowledge of Islam. If you're, wh wherever you're living actually, whether you're living in a non-Muslim non society or you're living in an Islamic society, uh, which we perhaps do not have no now, you know, where Islamic laws are applied. Um, so whether you're living in such a society or you're living among non-Muslims, non uh, there is a, a certain, you know, a basic amount of uh, teachings of Islam that Muslims have to know, not just how to perform salah in all of these circumstances and fasting and things like that and so on, but how to live with other people, how to interact with them. Uh, uh, is lying permitted? No, it is not permitted generally. Uh, deception uh, and that uh, 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 you're cheating, this deception and cheating and things like that are not, are, are not permissible. Uh, even if you're living in a non-Muslim society where alcohol is prevalent, you should, you know, later on, alcohol wa wa was uh, uh, wa was banned as a, you know, a gradual step-by-step -step, uh, banning of alcohol. Uh, and that uh, holds good for us today, no matter uh, who is uh, consuming alcohol all around us. And other things uh, in our economic, you know, how we earn uh, our livelihood, etc. These things were were, were developing. Uh, so, you know, I, I want uh, I want you to hope, uh, to remember. Uh, and I'll end with this point where you know we're a, a little past our time. Uh, although we started a bit late because of the uh, sound problem, uh, but. Uh, you know the, the uh, interest. Uh, so, uh, interest is something that uh, developed. You know, uh, and uh, uh, the the banning of interest. Uh, and so, uh, the things that are banned in Islam, the things that are made haram in Islam, uh, are of course haram for us uh, wheresoever we happen to be. Uh, we are not forced uh, to take interest. Uh, 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 perhaps there there might be some situations where we, we are forced to deal with interest, perhaps give interest, but we are not forced to take interest. So at least a part of an aspect of it we can avoid uh, completely. And then there are other, uh, other Islamic, you know, how we earn our, our, our livelihood cannot be by, by cheating and so by deception, right? Uh, we cannot, uh, uh, and we cannot indulge in any other thing that is haram, whether it is uh, uh, adultery or fornication and, and so on. So, uh, and a lot of these teachings had come in Mecca, but in Medina now they are being practically implemented. We have a society where all of these things can be implemented in the best way possible. And so no Islamic teaching uh, should be violated in an Islamic state. Uh, uh, and as soon as something happened uh, in, uh, in the state or the society that the Prophet Center was developing, uh, corrections came. A revelation came to correct uh, the situation and tell the Muslims what, what is right for them to do. But now that we have all of those teachings, you know, we still have to abide by most of them. Uh, there's hardly any of them that cannot be uh, applied uh, in our situation. Uh, in our situation, 
uh, if there's a you know a situation of intense hostility, then then perhaps there are certain things such as you know how we perform salah, uh, you know that uh, ha has to be uh, modified a bit. Uh, uh, that is uh, in accordance with the laws of fiqh, the rules of fiqh. So the so my point here just to reemphasize that and then close, uh, it is that uh, as, as Muslims we have to no uh, Islamic teachings concerning almost every uh, every aspect of life because they're you know these teachings are relevant for all the various aspects of life we have to know what we can apply and what we uh, can uh, you know uh, overlook uh, uh, based on certain circumstances what are the circumstances uh, when uh, conc concessions uh, can be applied so this is how a Muslim uh, must live his life. We must live with knowledge. We must practice Islam with knowledge. Okay, I think uh, we have come to an end of, to our session today. I don't see any further questions uh, in the chat area, so we we'll close. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable uh, acquire knowledge, uh, enable our knowledge to grow, enable our education to grow, and enable us uh, to put into practice the teachings that we learn. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us all uh, to be uh, the best examples of what a Muslim should be. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته